Okay, this lesson is very succinct and it basically addresses a topic that's always discussed, uh, free choice or choice. In one lesson, we evaluated the word free, which was a 13th century um, product from freto, means exempt from, and we have that up here, exempt from. And we noticed in philosophy, for example, a choice for some who assert, philosophically speaking, it's hypothetical, that for a choice to be free, it can't be coerced or uh, consequences, threats, or things like that. So where would we find a free choice, uh, that is a choice that is exempt from death, condemnation, liabilities, things like that? Well, the only free choice we have uh, is free grace. And um, like this cup, so I don't know who and what in the world's going on about Alabama. Somebody gave me this cup, I think because I've been a fan of Alabama football since 1972. And I remember our school here in Arkansas, anytime we beat Alabama, that was the standard. And then when we no longer, you know, met that standard, but Alabama, I, I don't know who in the world replaced my NASA cup, but the water's still just as good. But like that cup, I'll assure you that there, uh, Dr. Eddie Johnson referred me to a book called Confronting Calvinism. And it's at a resource that's listed on a website called faithalone.org. And here's books or um, magazines like uh, this one, Grace in Focus, talks about total depravity. This one talks about the Gospel of John. This one, I haven't even looked at this one yet. It talks about uh, Romans 8. This one, I did a cursory review. I'm going to do an entire evaluation of eschatology according to Koine. In this, a very uh, rational argument is made. It's from and through um, inductive reasoning. They even use numbers, which I really like that. Since the Bible has numbers, we should use them. But uh, the resource is very good in that they deal with um, the controversies. Uh, even a Zane Hodges, who the late Zane Hodges, I'm learning about him now. Uh, Dr. A. Johnson and I were, um, have been reading and evaluating this. And so it's been really interesting because the seminary we attended and with whom and which we're still affiliated and associated uh, is neither Calvinist nor Arminian. And that just makes it more, uh, you know, we were scripted, biblicist. So when I noticed Dr. Bob Wilkin identified himself as a biblicist, that was very uh, interesting because you hardly hear that anymore. So let's look quickly, and we'll use our language here at the Apologetic and Outreach Ministry of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, the IamCornet.org. And if you've studied your grammar at all and you've been using it, some of you have, uh, you'll come across all this, and we'll look at how we would approach this and see how succinct we can make it. First, let's come over here to the basics. And remember, we're asked things like lose or keep our salvation when that's a false dichotomy, and we know that in the Bible we are ones who, having been kept, a perfect passive participle, are always being kept. And we notice that the continuous action in a part, perfect participle or a perfect tense, for example, uh, has the idea of the voice continues passive, so the action upon us continues and persists and abides, and then the action itself. So we're always being kept. So that's a, that's what it says. And then unfathered, unsaved, unsanctified, unloved, unforgiven, unjustified, unredeemed, unprepared are examples of words that do not appear in the New Testament. They're not scripted at all. And we have this right here, this word here, to disbelieve. It's actually a word. It, it's, it's listed in the lexicon. And in Mark 16, 16, for example, it speaks of those who would deliberately cause themselves to disbelieve, negate faith. Then we have uh, pistuo, and that's misspelled. Sorry about that. That's uh, another one of those. Let's see if I can fix that. There we go, pistuo, there we go. So this is belief. This is deliberate, causal, person deliberate. Matter of fact, John 20, 31, it says that the signs of Christ, that he had, the signs that were there through his lifetime, 
have been scripted, particularly those particular signs were scripted and remain on record, perfect tense there, by the way, of Grafo, and they remain on record in order that we, that is the reader or the hearer, might deliberately cause, is actually a deliberative subjunctive for those of you that have studied that, cause uh, yourself, he or herself, a person can cause him or herself to believe, puncture action, simple form of action, that Jesus is the Christ. And subsequent to that act of trust Jesus for who he says he is, for the everlasting life he gives us and all that he promised in that gospel of John, for example, then subsequent to that simple act of believe, we are ones who are believing and as believers, we're having life through his name, in his name. So that takes care of that. It's just why do we have in the Bible, 1 John 5, 1, for example, says we've been, we who have been father always being father. And yet, um, off script, people assert this, but that's not in the Bible. Um, the Bible has paraphrastic, perfect, participle, passive in Ephesians 2, 8. So we're always, we're once, we're always being uh, saved. That's by the grace. That's a personification of Jesus. Jesus said in John 17, he's always sanctifying himself in order that we might be ones who having been sanctified are always being sanctified. And yet religion, and it's not people's fault. They're, I don't know if we can call them, they're perpetuating, they're repeating what they've heard, but they have no idea where it's written and it's nowhere written. So we, we approach people as uh, teachers first so that we want to bridge knowledge gaps. We have the perfect tense of love. We also have the great doctrine in Romans 5, 8 of kinsman redemption, where it says that the God, the Father, God, the Father of Jesus is always positioning his particular love onto us, uh, together with us, very strong, very uh, collective action there. Uh, and then it tells us why, because while we were still being devotees to sin, Jesus died for us. So the death of Christ for us in kinsman redemption, for example, is the causal basis for this transitive, deliberate, continuous action of God's demonstrable love for us. So that's uh, interesting that that's always, and we have another text where it's a perfect passive participle. We have for, sins forgiven perfectly, and yet those who don't know this say that we can become unforgiven. The publican, for example, Jesus said he went to his house. Uh, that man went down to his house as one who, having been justified once for all, was always being justified, declared right. And that was out from the causal basis of the Lamb from God that he appealed to God saying, God be merciful that is, conciliate yourself. It's the, the idea of propitiation. Uh, the mercy seat is, uh, Jesus is the mercy seat. That's a metaphor. Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's a metaphor. Jesus is our Passover. He, that's a metaphor. He's our rest. That's a metaphor. He paid it all. That's a fact. So Jesus said of that man who when the self-righteous Pharisee stood and prayed to God, prayed thus with himself, I thank thee, God, I'm not like other men are, extortioners, adulterers, even as this publican, he had so shamed the publican that a man wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, conciliate yourself, provide a base of satisfaction. So he was appealing to the provision of the lamb as the temple lambs were being offered there in that temple. And the one who had rejected it and didn't prefer the righteousness from God, which is demonstrated and defined by the faithfulness of Christ. He went about establishing his own righteousness, even saying that he fast twice in a week and give tithes of all, his, all he possessed. Now, how could the God, that is God, the Father of Jesus, be impressed with something like that rather than the faithfulness of his son who became, uh, who humiliated himself when he became an obedient one unto a, until a kind of death and that kind of death um, until which time he died and became a curse was he was crucified and hanged on the tree, as Paul said in Galatians, and thus he fulfilled all righteousness, he fulfilled all the law, and he did it with all his heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And no one was chosen, as in Isaiah 42, he was the elect one. Back to our language, there is no word for unjustifying, there is no word for unforgiving, unloving, unsanctified, unfathered, unsaved. Uh, there's no uh, perfect tense redeemed, perfect tense prepared, John said, that those people came and he baptized them and they uh, were ones who having been prepared were remaining prepared for a Lord, that's Lordship, control, a controller. 
And that was what the first act of John, the forerunner to get these people ready, was to bring them out. And through baptism, they were outwardly agreeing with God. Uh, Luke 7 says they declared God right by being baptized. And it says that the religious leaders, Pharisees particularly, had nullified the council boule uh, of God, um, Bulema, yeah, from Bulema, Bule, um, that told, counseled them, but it said they negated unto themselves. They didn't negate it unto God. No one, even by unbelief, uh, can do anything about God's plan. So that's a lot there. And then hope means certainty, according to the Bible. Uh, the only free choice is free grace. We'll see why you have hope and certainty. Uh, the Holy Spirit's the guarantee according to the Bible. The Good Shepherd said his sheep never die, never hunger, never thirst, uh, will never be seized away by a wolf. That's all part of the metaphor of a shepherd and wolf and sheep. Uh, never self-destruct. Remember he said they'll never perish. That's a middle voice. And what that means in that context, we'll never not be his sheep and he'll never not be our shepherd and we'll never self-destruct as a sheep, stop being a sheep as a result of our own actions. So even in our always being delivered, he comes and seeks us out. Uh, let's say someone strays from the flock. And here, for example, like at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Arkansas, someone strays from that flock. Uh, Jesus is faithful and we're faithful to be sent and work to retrieve them and assure that that takes place. So we've gone through this to begin here to have that which we can now know. But now how do we get there? Let's see what we have. We have uh, this verb for truth, aletheo, which means unconcealing. Paul said, I've become your enemy by telling you the truth. Apocalypto, that's the verb for apocalypse, revealing. So we have unconcealing, revealing, noticing, oida in English. It's idea in uh, Latin, it's video, and it's a sight word, insight. We have notice. Gnosko, knowing, patho, persuading, tasso, favorably disposing oneself, middle voice in Acts 13, 48, where we dispose and set ourselves uh, unto eternal life. And then, having done that, we then believe, being persuaded, we believe, receiving the knowledge, we believe, having the notice, as Paul said in Galatians 2, 16, the causal participle that said, by getting, by noticing that no kind of man is justified out from any kind of law, even we believe, simple form of action, deliberately caused ourselves. Remember, we're causal beings. Hifil, causative, action, uh, active. Uh, we're causal agents, causal beings. Deliberately caused ourselves to believe into Jesus Christ or that we might be declared right out from his faithfulness. And that's a fact. There's nothing greater, no other source out from which to be declared just and right except the faithfulness of Christ, which is the definition of the righteousness of God. So to re reject the righteousness of God, which is the faithfulness of Christ, someone is saying that they, not being chosen, Isaiah 42 says, notice the elect one God pointed to his son. And even at his baptism in one text, it says he's the elect one, the chosen one. Notice him, listen to him. And he told John he's going to fulfill the law, fulfill all righteousness. And he did that with all his heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. So if someone establishes their own righteousness, they're supposing their faithfulness and their obedience and whatever all that might be would somehow substitute for what Christ did. Uh, it's not even it's not even a consideration. Not even one man was ever born able or willing to fulfill the law and to fulfill all righteousness. We're not qualified. We're not chosen. We're not able. We don't even want to do it. So we have all this. You cause you to believe. So we have all these things that are occurring. And then we have uh, G138. Uh, I reo, to prefer or to be preferring. A noun means it's a preference. So do we have a preference that's free, exempt from, let's say like the law of sin and death, let's say exempt from servitude to the law, even though we of our own volition uh, make ourselves slaves of Christ, exempt from all men, Paul said, yet we make ourselves enslave ourselves to all men in order to gain more such as we make videos, we make publications, we go out into the communities, we go door to door, we leave information, we have websites, we have blog sites, uh, we have Facebook pages, we are not adversarial with our neighbors, we're here to become all things to all men to win. Uh, so we become a slave to our fellow man. Uh, some of us who could be doing other things are here at almost midnight after a long day of helping families, being in uh, behavioral 
center with family consulting, uh, being at an attorney today, being with another family at a job location, and then, oh my, anyway, and then still here with this glorious opportunity and advantage that we're exempt. Uh, here, children of the exempt woman, Galatians 4.31, remember, free, it means exempt. We're exempt from ignorance. You remember there are people who cannot say because of their uh, religious construct that they can say whether or not they know if Jesus did or did not die for them. Then there is the subjective lordships. I was asked about lordship salvation years ago when that was a buzzword. And I asked which one. And when you find out it's endless because who qualifies that? Because if you use typology, you have God's people in Egypt. You have provision of the lamb for them. They place on their doorpost called the Passover. Of course, that collaterally extended to Egyptians who would uh, avail themselves of that privilege to enter the house of those who had blood on the doorpost. So they were purchased, that's kinsman redemption. They then came out, they crossed the Red Sea. The New Testament says they were all baptized into Moses. The Bible says we're baptized into Christ. So we're washed by his blood, the blood of Christ, our Passover. The one provided the great sin bearer. We're baptized into Christ. We are then, Acts 2.42, we are uh, continuously, steadfastly abiding in the apostles' doctrine. That's all of our New Testament letters. That's our pastorals. That's our gospels that we have recorded. The New Testament. And in that steadfast continuous, we are fellowshipping into the gospel according to the letter to the church of Philippi, our fellowship in the gospel, which is into the gospel. And then, so we're fellowshiped. Acts 2.42 says, the apostles' doctrine, which is prerequisite to the fellowship, and that's the fellowship into the gospel. And then we have the breaking of the bread. That's the Lord's Supper. And prior to that, we self-examine, self-correct. But according to what? That would be according to the teaching and knowledge that we have. The divine order of creation is in the church letters that God is the head of Jesus. Jesus is the head of every man. The husband's the head of the wife and the children obey the parents. The husband is to submit himself to his wife by laying down his life for her. The wife is to submit herself to her husband by like the church submits herself to Christ. So unless people are doing that, that really wouldn't re re resemble lordship anyway. But let's not confuse what Christians do who are born again, who are fathered through the gospel, who do come out and are baptized, and who then do our fellowship into the gospel and engage actively in that fellowship and assembly and assemble together as our, the book of our new covenant, the book of Hebrews says that we aren't of those who turn away from assembling, that we are those who assemble faithfully. But don't confuse what those who what Christians do with what ch this choice here is. Sometimes we can take all the things Christians do and say, well, unless you do all that, then you can't trust Jesus. Well, the trust Jesus for everlasting life is the first thing and the only thing that you need to understand how that is so uh, marginalized by religion, but it's so maximized in the scriptures because it makes it... Uh, that one act of faith, it's even simple action in the Bible. Uh, people really marginalize that and they want to have performance-driven religion. We're exempt from that. We're exempt from other gospels, which Paul said aren't even other gospels. He said it's a different gospel, which is not even a gospel. So uh, we're exempt from fallible soteriological constructs. Uh, calm, I like to say that we're exempt from Calvin, Armin, Lutheran, Calvinism, Arminianism, Lutheranism, Molinism, and then just add A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, and then ask yourself why. Uh, sometimes um, you can be very uh, intimidated because people say you need to choose one of these, and yet uh, some say Calvinism is a gospel, some say Arminianism is a gospel, Lutheranism is a gospel, E, I, E, I, O. Uh, so now that we know what the gospel is, that's limited and defined by the person Jesus, the law is fulfilled by Jesus, all righteousness fulfilled by Jesus. The gospels are written. We know exactly what it is. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We trust in him for everlasting life. We have all that. So the only free choice, again, I'm demonstrating is free grace. But what does that mean? So before we go there, let's continue down this list. We covered this when we're here. Apocrino is, is the verb where we have answer away from judging. So we're judging. We're thinking about this stuff. Uh, diacrino, which is discerning. Then we have anacrino, which is evaluating. So um, I uh, exhaust myself in evaluation so that the outcome is certain and something in which we can have confidence. And that's why I was teaching you all how to use your language as I was taught. So 
Let's move to this column. We've got that covered. Here we are to prefer, preferring noun preference of free choice, but free from what, exempt from what, and then we went over that. Now we're here to prefer an unmerited exemption. I do favor this. <laughs> I want a gracious exemption. That's what free grace, free gift is a gracious gift, a gracious exemption. If you want to like show the implication of that, free from freo, 13th century, exempt from. Also this word, uh, eleutheroe means exempt. You can look that up in your uh, Greek lexicon. There's three places. Romans 5, 15, 6, 16, and 18, where it talks about free gifts. You can look that up, charisma. Notice that's from the word grace. It's an extension of grace. That's why it's called a free gift, a gracious gift, a gracious exemption, if you will. Uh, so what kind of gift of, would be better than a gracious exemption? And from what? For example, to disbelieve, this 569 over here is not a free preference. It might be a preference. A lot of people prefer to not deliberately cause themselves to believe. Uh, they uh, do not favorably dispose themselves toward eternal life. They judge themselves unworthy of everlasting life. Uh, they refuse to be persuaded. The Bible says they harden their own hearts. Paul says, harden not your heart. They reject knowledge while knowing it because at times Jesus was speaking and the Pharisees themselves had noticed that he was speaking of them and would become incensed and incited by it and seek even more through more determination to kill him. So how is it that they were without knowledge? They weren't without knowledge. And so they refused to uh, uh, acknowledge that which they notice, that which has been revealed. God's love for man is clearly revealed in Jesus Christ. God's grace, the grace is personified and exemplified in Christ. The righteousness of God is defined by the faithfulness of Christ. Everything centers on him. So there is no such thing as this being a free choice. When someone says, well, I'm free to disbelieve. No, you're not. When you disbelieve, it, you're not free from anything. You're just finding yourself under the wrath of God, as the Bible says in the Gospel of John. So uh, as we go through this, we're, all these are things we're exempt from, all false dichotomies, which I really like that, being freed from that. So. Uh, it really seems um, like a lot of work. I put all this up here first, but sometimes if I start talking and writing, we could be here for an hour, and I'd rather just put it on the board. You look at a lot of it's a review, some of these elements we've been over before, but nothing's, not, this is probably one of the most irrefutable points of all uh, when people want to become contentious rather than be discipled, and you just remember to tell them that if this any of this was scripted, We'd have a word for it. We'd have a number for it for those who don't read uh, Greek and don't want to or say, I don't need to know all that. Well, that's fine, but they can stop arguing if they don't have any interest and you don't have to waste your time. And then so remember, charisma is a gracious exemption. That's the implication. That's what's so glorious about it. And remember, before I leave off here, go to faithalone.org for this resource. I have great confidence in the book Confronting Calvinism because it was referred to me by Dr. Eddie Johnson. And it sounds a lot like the things we were specifically taught uh, in the seminary. And uh, some of this is not near as technical. I'm not saying this is a seminary where you're like, oh no, I'm not ready to go. But it's very, it's a level that you don't really need more. Um, and it it's uses language, so it's as high a level as it, uh, the Bible intends it to be. And it's very good ra reasoning and rationale. So have a blessed day and uh, be glad. <laughs> that the only free choice, this idea of making a choice, a preference that gives us an exemption. And of course, it's hard to find a class anywhere where people will take the time. So I'm just thankful for this format that has allowed us, we've had, we had a lot of people come our way that really didn't want people to be discipled, didn't want them to learn the Bible. And that's fine. If you're someone who's rejected the Bible, um, it, you'll find yourself driven to go out and negate, agitate, incite. Uh, that's the, uh, what happened in Acts 13:48. The social church went out, uh, the socialites, I call them like the Moabites and the Hittites, they're socialites, and they always go out to disrupt the disciple-making process and the peaceable assembly that we have there. So um, thankfully we have resources and we can get past that. And thankfully, that's it. like at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, we've grown way beyond uh, the smallness and dark-mindedness and hard-heartedness of the voids of the Spirit of Christ that had encroached upon us as um, craftily introduced false brethren and 
lewd and baser sorts. So um, just know this is it. It's a great argument. It's a great case. It's scripted. Have a blessed day and enjoy this lesson.